Amen. So keep your place there in Titus chapter 1. We're going to be in Titus chapter 1 throughout the entire sermon. So as I have you turn away from Titus chapter 1, you're going to want to keep a bookmark in that chapter. It's going to be kind of our main chapter for um, the entire sermon this morning. So the title of the sermon this morning, let me just give you the title first and I'll explain to you um, what it means. But the title of the sermon this morning is The Churchians. The Churchians. So I don't know if you've heard that term Churchian um, lately. It's kind of an urban term that has come up in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years, 15 years. I've been hearing this term um, in a lot of uh, blogs and on the internet hemisphere. You know, you're going to see people using this term Churchians. And basically what it is, is let me give you a couple definitions. You can find a bunch of different definitions of the term Churchian. Um, on the internet and on Urban Dictionary, but um, in the context that I normally see it used, yeah, I'm going to give these two definitions, all right? Churchianity is what um, this definition is. It's the embracing of the church subculture and all that goes with it, particularly the doctrinal and social aspects. That's the first um, definition. Another further definition is this, modern-day institutionalized Christianity. Basically, the leader decides what is truth, and what is lies based on a bunch of traditions, all right? That's a kind of an urban dictionary uh, definition of what a churchian is, all right? So what I want to talk about this morning is basically the word churchian is this, this derogatory term used for someone. It's a broad brush that paints people that go to and belong to a Christian church, all right? That's what the word churchian is used for um, if you see people using it in this modern day age and basically it's used by people who are you know against organized religion or against you know they're kind of anti-church and a lot of these people uh, claim uh, at least claim to be Christians and I think that there might even be saved people that are part of this movement as well this idea that you know um, church is bad and it's anti-church and you're gonna see this if you're a soul winner you're going to have your pulse on society like no other person out there. And this is something that you're seeing more and more and more of today is this anti-church philosophy. We don't need to go to any church. Church is in my heart or, you know, church is in my you know, living room or whatever it is. Um, but you're seeing this more and more and more. And COVID and the lockdowns and all these things just made this whole thing go um, crazy because like a lot of people this is my opinion but a lot of people that didn't really want to go to church they were going to a bad church or a lame church or whatever it was they didn't really like going to church anyway before covid they felt obligated to go to church maybe they're saved they felt you know their conscience telling them i should be going to church as your constant conscience should tell you that you should be going to church but then they had this excuse where they didn't have to go to church anymore and so they're like, yeah, we'll just, we'll just run with that. And we'll just keep that um, going the way it is. All right. So there's a real movement and a real increase in people today, even amongst the saved, that do not believe that they have an obligation or a responsibility or that God would even want them to go to a church. All right. Now, look. I get it, it's understandable in many cases, and I'm gonna go into some of the causes that are driving this movement later on in the sermon, but the problem is this, you know, what does the Bible say is the problem, all right? So let's look at what the Bible says, and then we'll look at, wait, later on we'll look at what the causes of this movement are, and then we'll look at the solutions, all right? So turn to Hebrews chapter number 10, turn to Hebrews chapter number 10, and turn there, I know Hebrews 10, 25, is the verse of the week, but just go ahead and turn there, if you would. Uh, we're going to go back one verse. All right, we're going to go back one verse to Hebrews 10 and chapter number or verse number 24. All right, we're talking about this anti-church movement, this term that is used by anti-church people to kind of paint anyone that goes to a church with which this with this derogatory term of a churchian. Oh, you're just a churchian. All right. Look at Hebrews 10 and verse number 24. So while I can understand, and I'm going to give you some of the reasons that this movement is growing 
today, and this movement has really always been around. I'm going to give you those reasons. But first of all, let's just look at what the Bible says, and let's start from there. All right, look at Hebrews 10, verse number 24. The Bible says, and let us, who's he talking to? He's talking to saved believers here. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So he's saying that we should not, you know, forsake the assembly of the believers, all right? As the manner of some is. Look, as the manner of some is, this is in Paul's time, and as the manner of some always will be, all right? But we're definitely seeing a trend today. But instead of forsaking the assembly, what is the opposite of forsaking the assembly? What's going to happen in the assembly? The ex exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So the Bible here says, and I'm going to bring you back here in just a few minutes, so keep a place here as well, but the Bible here is telling you that you come here to strengthen, to exhort, um, to grow, and strengthen one another as Christians. I mean, there's a point to coming to church. It's not just something God tells you to do. Well, God doesn't have all these commandments in the Bible just telling you, hey, do this because I said so, and I want to just control you. No, all of these things that God tells us to do are good for us. He tells us to do these things for a reason, all right? So there's a lot of people out there that'll say, okay, well, assembly. An assembly can just be my living room. Well, that's true to a degree. All right, many churches, many actual churches, legitimate churches, did start in someone's house. There is nothing wrong with that. This church is not this building. This church is the assembly of the believers. That's what the church is. Turn to Ephesians <coughs> chapter number four. Ephesians chapter number four. So, but most people are missing one main thing when they say, okay, well, my living room is my church. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse number 11. Because God has a very specific structure for churches. All right? There's no universal church. It's not the church. It's churches. And the Bible over and over again talks about this specific structure that we just read about in Titus chapter 1 about the structure on the head of the church, you know, Jesus Christ, and then who is to be the under shepherd of the church on earth. Look at verse number 11. Of Ephesians chapter number four. So this is kind of, you know, puncturing through this philosophy that any person can just have church in his house um, by inviting some friends over or whatever and just having, you know, creating his own church. The Bible says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's you. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the Bible here is saying that, you know, there's to be pastors and teachers. You know, the word pastor, elder, and bishop in the New Testament are all used interchangeably to describe a leader of a local church. Okay? And look, the Bible is very specific in 1 Timothy chapter number 3, and I'm going to have you go to Titus chapter 1. That's going to be kind of our, our main chapter this morning. But the Bible is very specific on who can be a pastor, on who can lead that local church. In Titus chapter number 1 and verse number 4, look what Paul says. I mean, look, the Bible is very specific in many places about the doctrine that the pastor must have, the character of the pastor, the, the demonstrated example of his life. He's not a perfect person. The fact that he's a man that is married, that has you know, children that are you know, in obedience to him, he has to not only have these characteristics of himself to you know, be not a striker, you know, not a drunk, all these different things of his character, but he has to demonstrate it in his own home. So it's very specific. He must follow the doctrines of the Bible and demonstrate these things in his life. Look at Titus chapter 1 and verse number 4. Titus chapter 1, verse number 4, before we get into those, um, into those actual characteristics, look what Paul says to Titus, mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain 
elders in every city as I appointed thee. And then he goes into the characteristics of what those elders are supposed to be. He goes into the qualifications of what a pastor is supposed to be. So in every city, in every church, there is to be elders leading these groups of assembled believers. So there's elders, pastors, bishops, all the same thing in every city here. That's the difference between, you know, a proper church and somebody just having a Bible study in their home. All right. The Bible is to be led. The church, according to the Bible, is to be led by a qualified leader. And that's where the whole term pastor comes in. Why? I mean, to keep the order of things. That's why. To make sure that the doctrines, because look, look, folks, anybody will tell you this. Anybody that's led anything will tell you this. One person needs to be responsible. I've said this many times. If everybody's in charge, nobody's in charge. If everybody's responsible, nobody's responsible. So when I give a task to somebody, whether it be in my house, whether it be at work, whether it be at the church, I can't like go and tell five guys like, hey, let's make sure we get this done because it probably won't get done. Why? Because every guy thinks the other guy's doing it. If nobody's in charge, if everybody's in charge, nobody's in charge. So God does not make this mistake. He ordains a man to lead the local church in every city, all right, to keep things in order. Now look, Titus chapter 1 goes into this, but the entire New Testament is devoted to the proper, you know, organization and management of the local church. I mean, that's what the letters to the churches are all about. And look, you say, why does there need to be one specific qualified person? Because as Titus chapter 1 talks about right after the qualifications of a pastor, there's plenty of unqualified people that will jump right into that job. And you can look at this in any aspect of your life. Look, folks, there is plenty, all you married people out there or people about to get married, there's plenty of divorced people that will give you marital advice freely. They will come up to you. They will tell you, here's what you need to do. Here's the way you need to handle your marriage. And they're like, they've been married three times. There's plenty of people who have children who are complete disasters who will give you parenting advice, who will step right into that role and just tell you how you need to raise your children. You will see this again and again and again in your life. Go on the Internet. There are people that will give you any kind of advice you want to hear. You're like, you just pick a conclusion. Like, I want to eat Cheetos for the rest of my life as a diet. I want a Cheetos diet. I'm sure there's somebody out there that will give you that advice that there's no problem with that. You can just eat junk food. I mean, isn't that like, there's diets all the time that are coming out where people are saying, like, you don't have to have any specific diet. You can eat whatever you want on my program. But there's plenty of unqualified people that will just tell you the, the, the most ridiculous things, the things that you want to hear, you have to understand that people need qualifications, all right? There's plenty of people that have failed at everything in their life that would love to just tell you how to run yours. There is no shortage of those people. That's why right after the qualifications of the pastor, look at verse number 10 of Titus chapter 1. He's literally saying in verse number 9, holding fast the faithful word. This is what this pastor is supposed to do. He's supposed to make sure that we hang on to the doctrines of the Bible in this church because people will come in that want to pull away from the Bible. It's the pastor's responsibility to hold fast the faithful word. Look at verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. There's plenty of people that are going to come in and just want to tell you what they want to tell you and just deceive you for their own vain reasons and just lead people astray. There is going to be no shortage of people. There was not a shortage of people at this time. There's never going to be a shortage of people like that. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 5, I'll just read it. I'll just read it to you. It says, it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. So it's better to have somebody who's qualified that's telling you everything, maybe when you don't want to hear all those things, than to just hear the song, somebody tickling your ears. Because many of these false, um, these vain talkers, these unruly people, and all these things, what do they do? They're very good at telling people 
what they want to hear to manipulate them to their end, to whatever they're trying to get out of the situation. All right? So look, all that to say this. The Bible is clear that you should attend a church, a gathering of believers, and that that church should be led by a man meeting the biblical qualifications. Amen. The man being one of the qualifications, that he's a man. All right? And look, I mean, it's all about doctrine. It's all about, that's clearly what the Bible teaches. So, I mean, literally most of the epistles are written to churches or pastors or future pastors of churches telling churches, do this, don't do this, specific things. Don't allow this, allow this, you're making a mistake here. Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3, going through seven churches. Here's what you're doing wrong. Here's what you're doing well. Here's what you're doing wrong. Here's what you need to change. Here's what you need to fix. First Corinthians, here's what you need to get out of the church. Oh, God better, bring them back into the church now. This is what the Bible is teaching just over and over and over. It's about the management and the proper execution of the local church. How could you possibly have a Bible in your hand and be against the local church? That's right, right. When that's what the New Testament is talking about. Amen. It's the local church and its role in our lives as Christians. Its proper role. But look, I mean, it's just, the, the Bible's just how, how to run a church. Like, how in the world do you know how to run a church? Well, the Bible. Amen. It's easy. All I have to do is follow what the Bible says. I mean, it's not easy all the time. But when there's difficult situations, it's really not that hard for me, to be honest, when, when there's difficult situations with the church because, like, it's just the Bible. So it, it may be uncomfortable at times, mostly for other people, but it's just the Bible. Like, that's the authority, all right? And look, it's just talking about what the first work should be, things that they've done wrong, things that they've done right. So look, it's Bible 101 to say that this no church movement is wrong. I mean, we didn't have to do a deep Bible study as an introduction this morning. But the point is this. Here's the problem. And here's where this movement comes from. Most churches today are bad. This is where the movement comes from. If you decided, if you just got saved yesterday and you were going to decide where to go to church and you were going to take a list of all the churches in your local city and you were going to throw a dart and just choose that way, the odds are overwhelming that you would end up in a bad church. But it's always been this way. This is nothing new. There's nothing, you know, there's no new thing under the sun. You're, it's going to be led by an unqualified false teacher, probably. So what's the solution? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Keep your place in, first, in uh, Titus chapter 1. What's the, what's the solution? How could you possibly know, should I just have to go to 30 different churches and, and pick that way until I get a good one? No, well, the first solution is this. Know the Bible. And look, you don't even have to be a Bible scholar. You just have to know a little bit of the Bible. Like, here's, here's one that's going to cut out maybe 80% of all bad churches, just know the gospel. And if you're saved, you should know the gospel. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. It says, in verse number 3, it says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. There is no simpler thing in the Bible than the gospel. There is no simpler concept than the gospel. We saw, you know, five young men yesterday, like, just understand the gospel. Is it simple? A gift is simple. You did nothing. You didn't deserve it. You deserve to go to hell. Jesus paid for everything. All you have to do is put your trust on him, and that's it. Not your works. Not even 1% of your works. Trust Jesus, his sacrifice, his resurrection for your salvation. That's it. That's simple. That is the simplest thing in the Bible. But look, this is the largest cut right there. If you just knew that, and you just checked the gospel of the church that you were considering going to, right there, right there you're going to get like 90% of the churches out of the way. I mean, I just think about the small town that I went to church in when I was a kid. In this church, there was like, or in this town, there was like, 
I don't know, there's like five Lutheran churches. Crazy. But yeah, there's like five Lutheran churches. There's a Catholic church. I mean, this is like every small town in America right here, or at least in the Midwest. There's a Catholic church. There's a, usually a Pentecostal, uh, um, Pentecostal church of some kind. And then there's, uh, you know, basically that's it. <laughs> Sometimes there's a Baptist church, but it's very small. But 90, 90 plus percent have a false gospel of these churches in all these small towns. Then you get, you know, you get your cults, your Seventh-day Adventists, your Mormons, your JWs, all that stuff. You know, I'd maybe throw the Pentecostals in the cult thing too in, in some cases. But the point is, is if you just knew the gospel, you would just, you would increase your chances, you know, 10 to 1 right there. All right, the second one is this. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5. And look, you're saved. You know the gospel. Look, if you're saved, you know the gospel. If you're saved, you know, you know that salvation is a gift. It's not of works. There's, it's, it's plus nothing, minus nothing. It's Jesus. It's faith alone. That's it. It's eternal security. You can't ever lose it. And if you know those things, you can cut through a lot of these false teachers. But here's another one that you need to look at. You need to check the constraint. And this is what would catch a lot of people. This is what would catch a lot of people. And this is what turns a lot of people against church where they just paint the idea of church with this huge broad brush is because they were in churches that just had this massive constraint over them. But the gospel most times will fix this as well. But look at 1 Peter chapter number 5. This is a, a, a message to pastors. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says, feed the flock of God which is among you. He's talking about, he's talking to the under shepherd. He's talking to the pastor of the church, taking the oversight thereof. So I have the oversight of this church in the stead of Jesus Christ, not by constraint, though. See that? But willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So the Bible here is saying, I can't come in here and want to try to control you. That's not my job, to take constraint over you. Good, because I would never want it. Amen. It's not by constraint, but willingly. What? What does that mean? It means that I'm supposed to teach you the Bible, and you're supposed to willingly want to do the Bible. You're supposed to willingly want to hear the Word of God and put that in, in, uh, in action in your life. But see, what happens is men get up and they preach the Word of God, and people don't listen. And they're like, oh, yeah. am I wasting my time writing all these sermons? I have felt this way before. But they're like, what am I going to do about this? So, like, bad men change doctrine to try to constrain people. That's where a lot of this false doctrine comes from. It's really two reasons. It's constraint and it's filthy lucre. It, it's constraint. So, I want to try to control you. So, what do I do? I'll just change doctrine a little bit to say, if you don't repent of your sins, if you don't turn from the things that you're doing, you're not even saved. I'll take constraint over you in the, in the most powerful way that I can using your own salvation. This is what, I should quit using myself as examples because people will take like sound bites of this and put it somewhere. But a pastor, a false teacher will stand up and say, I will just tell them that if they don't listen to my sermon and they don't get this out of their life and they don't do this, which maybe is a good thing, like, hey, quit drinking or you're not saved or whatever. That's basically what repenting your sins is, is you have to turn from these sins or you're not saved. Or, you know, I, as the pastor, will doubt your salvation or whatever. It's constraint. That's all it is. That's where it comes from. All of these false doctrines that add works to salvation, it's for exact, it's the exact same reason. I mean, just think of, uh, what's, what's some other ones? I mean, just think of uh, Lordship Salvation. Think of Lordship Salvation. What is that? Well, if you don't do the works, you're not really saved. Which works? Well, I decide. I mean, the false pastor decides. You see what I'm saying? It's just, it's all constraint. It's all constraint. Like, I've literally heard a Baptist pastor, who I believe was saved, literally stand up and say to his congregation, if you don't listen to this sermon and apply this sermon, I don't even think you're saved. Or I doubt your salvation. Like, why are you going there? That, you know, your salvation, 
It didn't come from me, and it's not kept by me. Thank God for that. I wouldn't want to keep your salvation. I wouldn't even be able to keep my own salvation if it, was, if it wasn't eternal. So the point is, it's all, all these false doctrines. I mean, just think about infant baptism. Why? Why, infant, why baptize babies? Why did the Catholic Church, if you're thinking about control and money, it's brilliant. Why? Because, oh, you've got to come through the, that, the doors of this place if you want your kids to go to heaven. Lutherans, Catholics, all the same thing. Catholics literally, I don't know, they're probably liberal on this now, but Catholics literally wouldn't bury children who died that weren't baptized. Because Catholics and Lutherans believe, and look, I mean, they may not put this out there today, but I know they believe this because like, they, they preach it, it's what they teach, that a child is saved from the time that, you know, this is what Lutherans believe anyway, that the ch a child is saved through baptism. It is the means of grace that they are given God's grace. And then as they get older, the Lutherans will believe, well, then they need to believe or whatever. It's so confusing that most Lutherans couldn't even tell you. But they believe that you're given salvation through baptism. It's adding to the gospel. It's adding works to the gospel. Why? Because you better bring your kids here if you want them to go to heaven. Who doesn't want their kids to go to heaven? It's constraint is what I'm trying to get you to see. All the sacraments, what are they? It's constraint. It's constraint. It's things, I don't care, let's just make up more sacraments. Like it's just more control that the church has over your salvation. But it's all false. Because the church, the pastor, the priest, the pope, whoever, what false teacher, will never have any control over your salvation. Because your salvation, whether or not you have trusted on Jesus Christ or not, that's all you. That's why don't you feel bad if you go to somebody's door and you present them the gospel and they hear the gospel and they don't believe it. That's not on you. That's on them. That's the brilliance of, of how God made salvation because your belief is yours alone. It's not collective. My dad was a deacon. My mom is a pastor. That's not going to get you to heaven. That's a false gospel. Salvation is not collective. Look, a church, a gathering of believers, we have great power to exhort one another, to strengthen one another. But your salvation, that's yours. And no one can constrain you with that. Loss of salvation, it gives the church control. This is why, you know, Pentecostalism many times, like just like pure Pentecostalism, not the liberal version of it, but pure Pentecostalism. I just had people tell me at the door yesterday to save people that got out of a Pentecostal church and told me, they're like, yeah, it was like a cult. I'm like, well, yeah, it is a cult. It is a cult because it's, it's somebody that's standing up there because, you know, here's the thing. Loss of salvation. You know, you better listen to what I'm saying. You better not do certain sins. Look, which sins? How many? How often? Well, the pastor defines. The false teacher defines. How many? Which ones? How often? That, that's a cult. That's someone that's trying to gain control. Most, like, fundamental Pentecostals, when I say fundamental, I mean Pentecostals that really believe the Pentecostal doctrine, they are terrified people. They are people that are constantly worried that they're going to go to hell. That's not the gospel. That's a false teaching. That's somebody that has gone into, you know, religion or whatever just to control people and take constraint over people. And, and the, like I said, the, the real doctrinal, fundamentalist Pentecostals are very good at it. And they can really get a hold of people. And people are really scared um, that are in those things. But these people yesterday, it was interesting. They're like, oh, yeah, it was like a cult. And I'm like, why? And they're like, well, they, he just said, like, if we left the church, we're going to go to hell and all this kind of stuff. And they're like, we know, we know that's not true. And I'm like, exactly. <laughs> Like, that is a cult. Like, I don't think you should leave this church, but if you leave this church, you're not going to go to hell. If you're saved, you're saved. There's no constraint there. It should be willing. It should be willing. See, the Bible teaches and warns so much about these types of leaders that would take constraint over people mainly for the purpose of money is what the Bible is teaching about false prophets. And look, you'll see that, you'll see that everywhere. 
You see that with the mega churches. You see that the mega churches don't necessarily do it by constraint. They do it by tickling ears. They do it by telling people everything that they want to hear, by not saying things in the Bible that, you know, would upset people or what divide people. So there's the constraint and there's the, there's the, the mega church pastors who are just bring everybody in and they don't teach any doctrine at all, but it's all for filthy lucre. It's all the same thing. I mean, this is really the problem with true leadership, and you're going to see this all over your life. The problem with true leadership is really anybody worthy of it, many times, just think politics for a second. Anybody worthy of true leadership is generally not going to want it. You think about a, a politician, like this is why like all politicians are pretty much dirtbags. You say, why? Because like no decent man would ever want to go into that line of work. You say, why is that? Because, because he's, if he's a man, like the Bible is calling out in Titus and 1 Timothy chapter 3, if he's a man of good character, he's a man that works hard, he, he's, probably, he's got a trade, he's got a purpose, he's probably already doing what he wants to do with his life. He's probably got a, you know, a, a, a nice, you know, beautiful wife and a beautiful family, and he's probably just doing really well. And it's like, why would he ever want to put himself in a position where he's like, number one, like just dealing with a bunch of other dirtbags, and number two, where people are just going to attack him and try to like lie about him and destroy him and all these different things. He's like, no, he's like, I've got a, a decent thing going myself. Why would I want to ruin that by just going into this mud pit over here? You know, this is the problem. This is the problem with leaders, you know, generally today. But look, for pastors, for pastors, this is why there's a, that I believe that God gives a desire to men to be a pastor. So if there wasn't that desire given by God to men, I, I mean, I don't think many decent men would want to be pastors either. I'm thankful, you know, for that desire from God. But because, look, honestly, like personally, just a testimonial, I don't need to be in charge of anything. I, I don't need that, you know, in my life. I, I never had more... I, I never had more freedom, I never had more fun, you know, than just being a church member, actually. It was great. Really enjoyed being a church member of a great church. And even, even in the secular world, and I've said this to, to guys that go out in, in the workforce, I'm like, you know what, don't be one of these guys that just like wants to get, be the boss and just wants to be the, the manager job. No, the best thing you could do, I never had more freedom and just more autonomy than when I was just an engineer. That was the best right there. And that's why I tell the guys, I'm like, hey, you don't want to be the boss, you want to be the expert. You know, just get good, just get better than everybody else at whatever it is that you do. You want to be the expert, not the boss. But look, turn to Ezekiel chapter number 33. As for me, I'm glad that God gives men the desire to go into the ministry. But as for me in the ministry, I, I, don't, I don't need to be in charge of anybody. The last thing I would want to do is try to, like, you know, try to control people's lives. I mean, the whole thing is just, it's distasteful, com you know, completely. You know, I want you to do what the Bible says. I want you to listen to my sermons. I spent hours and hours and hours writing sermons and, and just studying through and pouring through the Bible and just so I can get this doctrine to you in a way that you can easily apply to your life. I want to get, you know, even complicated things explained in a simple way so you can take that and be like, oh, I see that. I can apply that. I can fix that. But I want you to do that willingly. Have, there's nothing in me that wants to control anyone. It's, my, it's simply my job to tell you. That's it. It's simply my job to tell you the doctrines, you know, basically everything. And that's why if I leave something out, that's on me, though. So these things are things that I'm careful about. Look at Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse number 3. And you can apply this to everybody, soul winners, but I mean, I really look at this as something that applies directly to a pastor, someone leading a church. The Bible says in Ezekiel 33, 3, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. So that's really like a release for me. As long as I tell you, as long as I blow the trumpet, and then you just go off during the week and you do whatever you're going to do, that's on you. 
Look, if it comes to a point where it's starting to hurt things in the church and then I have to fix things in the church, then that becomes on me. But if I tell you doctrines and you don't put those things into, into play in your marriage, in your family, with your children, whatever it is, that's not on me. The problem is, is that, look at verse number five. It says, he heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman, that's who, I, that's who I hope everyone is, willingly, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, this is the, the liberal pastor right here that's saved and just doesn't want to offend anybody. And blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman, at the pastor's hand. That's a pastor that is not telling people the truth. And look, a pastor that is not preaching doctrine, that is not preaching, you know, the things of the Bible, eventually will end up with a church full of unsaved people. A pastor that allows people to get up and, like, toy with repent of your sins type, type language, that's not going to cause people in the church that are currently saved to, you know, not be saved anymore, but that's going to cause people that come into the church, say we quit soul winning, you know, I just get really watered down in the doctrine. I'm like, ah, lordship, salvation, repent of your sins. It's all pretty much the same thing. But guess what that's going to mean? That's going to mean that people that come in here are going to be confused. They're never going to get saved. It will, it will end in disaster. And the Bible says that that pastor is responsible for that. All right. So look, the point is this. Now look, it's my job to manage the church according to the Bible. It's my job also to protect the church according to the Bible. Which are two things that are really one and the same. That's why doctrines like the reprobate doctrine, all these it's so valuable that they're practiced. Yeah. You know, it's June now. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that really bugs me about June is like it's my birthday. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like this really bothers me. Like it's my birthday and the first thing we got to talk about is homos. And I'm just like, it's my birthday, though. Yeah. <laughs> it's simply my job to protect the church. That's all. How do I do that? Well, I just follow the doctrine of the church. So whatever, you know, the world wants to do, none of that unnatural perversion or any of it will ever be here. Why? Because it's my job to protect the church. So that's all you need to know. Get your kids out of school. Get into a good church, which is this one, and I'll protect the church. I won't allow that stuff in here ever over my dead body. So my wife told me yesterday, I was underneath, I was underneath the sink fixing the garbage disposal, and my wife, you know, it's June 1st, which is either, you know, a great day, you know, my birthday, or, you know, abomination day or whatever, you know. But my wife's like, look at this in the newspaper. And I'm just like, oh. I can about imagine. First of all, it's a newspaper. Who, ever get, who gets a newspaper anymore? But now we get this, we get this small newspaper in it where we live now. And we got this newspaper. And my wife gave me this newspaper as I'm underneath the sink. She's like, look at this. And she shows me this newspaper. I brought it for you here. And here I'm expecting it. You know, it's June 1st. I'm just expecting some horrible thing, right? And here's what the article says. It says, Merced Judge. This is the... This is the the Independent, the official publication of Southeastern Madera County. And I'm subscribing to this thing. I don't know what you have to do, but I'm subscribing. It says, Merced Judge releases convicted child molester to Madera County. And this is the front page of the paper. A picture of the guy. And you know what? I'm like, praise God for this publication. Because what are they doing? They're protecting the community. They can't stop this judge, this wicked, evil judge. This guy's been, you know, in and out of uh, trouble for child molestation for his, like, his entire life. He's, uh, it's the third of his life. He's spent a third of his life behind bars and mental hospitals for crimes against children. And this judge lets him out. Well, and th this, this publication is like, what can I do? What can I do? Well, I guess we can, tell, we can show people. Yeah. We can warn people. Good for them. Good for them. We need more people like this. I don't know what this is, but if I got to pay them uh, 10 bucks a month or something, I'm doing it. Because good for them for protecting. Look, it's my job to protect the church according to the doctrines of the Bible. And God tells me, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ tells us, just follow the doctrines of the Bible and there will be no problems.
The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All you have to do is just follow what I tell you to do. That's it. So that's my job. Not to constrain, not to make, you know, filthy lucre or whatever. But look, back to this idea of this anti-church movement. To all these people that are telling people this or people that don't think that they need to go to church anymore, let me just say this. Rare doesn't mean non-existent. The real churches have always existed. They've always been there somewhere. All you have to do is know a little bit of Bible and, and, just, and just find one and just go there. That's it. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. But look, I get it. I get it. People have been hurt in these bad churches. I understand that. I've met many people who have been hurt in bad churches. Look, they've been financially taken advantage of. I've heard stories out soul winning of some of these churches, even in Fresno here, that will literally send a financial advisor to your house. I mean, look, the Bible teaches give 10% to the Lord. But look, that's a very easy percentage. I don't need to help you with that math. I'll tell you what the Bible says. What you do or don't do, that's on you. That's between you and the Lord, just like every other doctrine in the Bible. People have been taken advantage of by wicked people in the church. Many times church leaders. Kids have been abused. You know, people have been physically abused in other horrible ways in churches. So then they go and they paint with this broad brush that all churches are bad. But no, because all churches are not bad. All churches would not allow. Look, you, you have to have the reprobate doctrine. Or you will have wicked people in your church. Because it was just another sin, just like every other sin. Are you perfect, brother? Ugh. It's so important to have every doctrine of the Bible, no matter how unpopular it is in that day and time, to be preached. But what they do is people have gotten into bad churches that have had horrible things happen to their families, to themselves, and what do they do? They throw the baby out with the bathwater. And then the worst thing is, is they take other people with them. They take other people with them. They lead others, you know, down this anti-church movement path. You know, they lead others astray. And look, people, there's a market for it because people don't want to go to church today. So people take this bait and they're like, yes, there's a reason I don't have to go to church. Because this horrible thing happened to this person in this bad church. Yes, there's bad churches out there. Find a good one. They're out there too. People don't got, want to go to church today. U.S. church attendance is on the extreme decline. In 2000, this is amongst religious Christian people, by the way. This isn't like the broader population. In the year 2000, it was 42% of people that said they were Christians went to church. In 2011, it went to 38%. In 2021, it's at 30%. I guarantee you today, it's well below 30%. I couldn't find any great numbers, but I, after COVID, are you kidding me? Pe you can see this out soul winning. People simply didn't go back. Yeah. They quit going to church, and they just didn't go back. So the point I'm trying to make is this churchian narrative sells. It sells to people. It resonates with people, but it's not what the Bible says, and it doesn't work. Right. Go back to Hebrews chapter 10. Go back to Hebrews chapter 10. It doesn't work for your Christian life. It's not going to help you grow in the faith, grow in the Word of God. It's not going to work for you. Look at Hebrews 10 and verse number 26. In Hebrews 10, 25, it talked about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. In verse number 26, it talks about for, meaning this is what's going to happen to you if you quit going to church. This is what's going to happen to you if you get out of church, get out of the Word of God, get out of the assembling of yourselves together. If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. This isn't talking about losing your salvation. This isn't talking about, you know, not being saved anymore. This is talking about somebody that knows what they're supposed to do because they used to be in church, and now they're willfully sinning. The Bible's saying Jesus isn't going to die for you again, buddy. Jesus died on the cross one time. All that remains is punishment. All that remains is chastisement on this earth. That's what the Bible is teaching here. But a certain fearful looking of judgment and fiery indignation. That doesn't mean hell just because it says fiery. It means God is angry with you, which shall devour 
the adversaries. It's saying you won't be right with God and he's going to chastise you. Especially if you know what you're supposed to be doing and you're not doing it. The Bible's exhorting one another to keep the faith, have a proper relationship with God, separate from the things that, you know, do the things we should do and separate from the things that we shouldn't. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse 13. Just one chapter over, the Bible says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You know what? It's hard to be a stranger and a pilgrim by yourself. It's hard to be a stranger and a pilgrim by yourself. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, it says we're to come out from among them and be ye separate. It's hard to be separate by yourself. As a matter of fact, it's so hard that most people will separate by themselves and they'll stop being separate because they're all alone. Because it, it's, it's hard to do. People who separate alone typically don't stay separated. I mean, here's a separation trick for you, and I've mentioned this before. But you must separate unto something. You can't just like, hey, family, I just got saved and we're changing everything, and we're just never going to do anything anymore. And that's it. We're going to sit inside our house, and we're going to read the Bible, and we're not going to go to, you know, we're not going to have friends, we're not going to do any of these things. Like, you have to separate unto something, or it won't work, the Bible is teaching us. And that's what the assembling of ourselves together is for. I mean, in 1 Peter chapter 2, it calls us peculiar. You know what it says? It says, you are a peculiar people. It doesn't say you're a peculiar person all by yourself. It's like, look, we're peculiar people together. We're peculiar. People look at us and they're like, you're weird. You don't do that stuff? You're weird. Great, we're all weird together. Right. We're all peculiar together. It's easy to be peculiar when you're not by yourself. It's hard to be peculiar alone. Peculiar people. I mean, the best example is soul winning. You go soul winning out in an unreceptive area. We've been hitting a couple unreceptive areas lately. But you go and you do that and you're like, I'm soul winning with, with my wife and I and we're our, we're, we're our own church. And you go soul winning in unreceptive areas. And you know what? Like, you're just going to get beat down. You're going to get beat down and other people aren't soul winning. And you go into, uh, it's, it's super demoralizing when you're by yourself. I mean, you're going to start to have thoughts that creep in like nobody wants to hear this. What are we doing out here? People just slamming doors in my face. Is this really my responsibility to go out and, and just like bring the gospel to these people that don't even want it anyway? These are the kind of thoughts that will creep in if you're by yourself. But you know what? If you're with a local assembly of believers and you go out soul winning, like when we're in a super receptive area, like it's just like me and Brother Jeff, like I almost like don't see the doors. It's weird to like just talking the whole time. It's like I don't even like really remember the unreceptive days. It's just great fellowship days. You know, you're just out there, and it's, it's, like, it's like nothing. It's like water off a duck's back when you're with a local group of believers. And guess what? You go out this afternoon at 2 o'clock, and you just get beat down, and, and 80 people slam the door in your face. You come back here, and you're going to find that there was another group. You know, I always say that. I always say that when I'm out, and there's other groups out, and like, I'm just like, I'm taking one for the team here. Because I know I'm going to go back, and somebody's going to have great stories. Some of these have great stories where, like, they just hit, like, this, this place where, like, all these people, you know, we had multiple salvations. Happens all the time. Amen. But you know what that is? That's exhorting one another. Amen. That's exhorting one another. I mean, you don't want to be, like, you know, James and John, like, calling down fire and, like, just getting all depressed about, you know, people being unreceptive. But soul winning can do that to you. And, like, with a church, it's completely different, though. I mean, it's just great fellowship, success stories. It's awesome. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 10, I'll just read it for you. What's the point of all of this church? What's the point of assembling and all the exhortation and all the growth? It says, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is one thing, that no matter what I preach, I wish people would understand that applying the word of God and growing into Christian faith it's about you being fruitful, which means you will or will not affect other people, not yourself. Amen. So if you don't listen and you're not willing, you're going to be unfruitful, which means other people will suffer. Right. 
People that get backslidden and out of the Christian life, they're literally harming the eternal destiny of Lord knows how many other people. That's how important keeping right in your Christian life and being with the proper assembly is. It's important to those around you, not just you, not just your children, which is important to your children as well. But look, the point is this. People have had bad experiences, and they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater on this church thing. They're just like, my church was bad equals all church is bad. Wrong. You just had a bad church. And to those people, it's not surprising that you had a bad church because the majority of churches are bad. It's not just you that this has happened to. I am sure most of us in this room have been in bad churches. I've been in bad churches for literally decades in my life. But that doesn't mean all churches are bad. It just means that most of them are. And it's easy to find a good one. But that's why the Bible is warning us about false doctrine, false religion, false teachers. It's a main theme in the New Testament, especially. Be, so we shouldn't be surprised. You shouldn't be surprised if you found a false teacher, if you found false doctrine, if you found a false church. It's always been this way. It's not just 2024 America. It's always been this way since Paul's time since Jesus' time, and it always will be. So for everybody else that's listening to this stuff, especially saved believers, like, look, it's a cop-out, and you know it is. Amen. It's a cop-out for backslidden Christians yep. right. that don't want to get anything out of their life. Yeah. Yep. It's a cop-out for people that don't want to separate, they don't want to clean up their life, they don't want to be peculiar or strange. They just want to be in the world. They don't want to sound any different. They don't want to look any different. They don't want to do any of that stuff. It's just, they're just backslidden. And that's the market that all these, you know, people that are throwing out this churchian, you know, doctrine, that's the market share that they're getting is backslidden Christians. It's pitiful. It's pitiful. It's so important that you protect your spiritual life. Because, I mean, as you get backslidden, by the way, and this is a good, you know, this is a good um, way to put it. As you get backslidden, some of this stuff may become appealing to you. Some of these thoughts may creep in, like, ah, do I really need to go to church that much? Do I really need to go to church? You know, the pastor says three to thrive. Pfft. Three to thrive. Amen. Three to thrive. Three to grow. Amen. It's better for you. Amen. It's better for you to come to church more than it is to come to church less. It's essential for your Christian life. It's essential for edification, exhortation, fellowship, and ultimately fruitfulness. Because the first thing that goes away in the Christian life is soul winning. So protect your Christian life. Don't listen to this garbage. If you're not in a good church, you need to get in one. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.